Welcome back to Through the Ringer. I'm your host, Tate Frazier. We have a jam-packed show today. We got Nora Princiati coming up on the other side. But first and foremost, we got Cousin Sal, not in the building, but he's here in spirit. And he's here right now on your screen. Cousin Sal, good to see you. I am in the building. I'm in the basement, Tate. I'm just embarrassed about how I look, so I'm not going to make it all the way up. But thanks for having me. Hey, Good time. Ha happy Halloween. We had a fun weekend. I uh, got to enjoy uh, a nice Halloween extravaganza. That's a nice little teaser. We got some photos that we'll show a little bit later. But, Sal, before we play my favorite game, we got to do first Tate, and I got some takes to throw your way. And we'll okay. start here with my guy, Justin Herbert. Uh, QB one there for the Los Angeles Chargers, near and dear to my heart, Sal. I say to you, the NFL needs to just suspend any player who intentionally tries to hurt another player. Obviously, we saw the Gator rolls uh, this weekend, and then Bozeman coming over and handling business uh, after his quarterback mm -hmm. took a shot. Your thoughts on this? Should we just ban guys for actually trying to hurt people on a football field? I think so. I mean, this one, they was guy was holding on to Herbert's leg like yeah, it was like Walking much. Dead. He was like a zombie about to bite it off. I don't know what he's doing. Yeah, I hate that. Shit. I'm glad that they. Uh, I mean, that that was. Uh, yeah, they said Hail Mary was the play of the week. I thought this. I'm mean, him just getting leveled. It was like Roman Reigns at WrestleMania at SoFi taking him out and uh, let that maybe be a lesson to him. But maybe Tate, maybe better than the suspensions. All the linemen should get to line up and deliver a spear. Uh, to this, uh, you know, offending player, because I think that would send more of a message. Yeah, that would be good. Uh, Nathan Shepard is his name. There's a lot of people that came out. I mean, he's got a crazy story. He went from working in a factory to being kind of found a hidden gym at a senior bowl to mm. playing in the NFL, getting this big contract. But get again, don't do that. Get suspended for the year when you do it. And uh, I like. Yeah, the maybe he should be sent back to the factory. <laughs> right. I don't, what were they? What were they making in the? Factory? I don't know. Maybe <laughs> we'll, we'll go figure it out. We'll go. We'll go do some garment research, and uh, we'll get back to you yeah, there. But uh, overall, maybe. Uh, suspend these guys when they try to hurt someone, especially franchise quarterbacks. Next one, Sal. First take for you. The NFC West is the best divisional race. If you look at the odds right now, nobody knows, not even Vegas, what's going to happen in this division. You can buy into the Seahawks. You can buy into the 49ers when they get McCaffrey back. You got the Rams, obviously, with their pedigree. Uh, you can basically talk yourself into anybody, even Kyler Murray. So I say it's the best divisional race we got going. What say you, Sal? I think so. I don't think they're, the teams are as good as those in the AFC North, which is also a good race, but this might be the most competitive when it comes down to it. Like you said, you can get good odds for a team like the Rams, close to 5-1, to one, or even Seattle, who was in first place a couple of weeks ago, and now they've dipped a little there in the 4-1 to one range. But I wonder, now every team is either has injuries or you know is one player away from like blowing the whole season. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder, though, if we should just look at this and say – San Francisco at minus 130 with CMC coming back after the bye might just be a juggernaut again, and uh, we're foolish to not jump on them now. Yeah, I think just the optimism that anything could happen, but like you said, they're, they're already at minus money at this point, so uh, Vegas does kind of lean that way where the 49ers will make it happen. Last one, Sal. It's Halloween season, as we said, and I say to you, homemade treats – are the best Halloween candy. If you did live around <laughs> teachers, teachers always had the best goods, the best baked goods in the city. You know, sometimes you get a caramel apple. You know what I mean? You never know what's going to be around the corner, Sal. So if you get a homemade treat, <laughs> a full candy bar, that's the good kind of Halloween. So uh, that's my big take for Halloween. What say you? You got real kids running up to your door and asking for candy. Yes. So you really deal with this issue. I really do. And what a homemade treats. What homemade you, treats. I, I, I'd love to see the little house you lived in on the prairie. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness. Nice. Uh, no, I don't like the homemade treats because even when I was young, people were like, uh, you know, less crazy. The world was not as full of hate and weirdos. Mm. You really still couldn't t uh, trust the homemade treats. I love I love the giant almond joys. You rarely see them, right. but that's my jam. Also, jam is my jam, uh, as you can <laughs> see. I got a lot of jams, but I had sugar at my Halloween party for the first time in like 12 days, and I was flying around the <laughs> living room like cocaine bear. Yeah. And so, yeah, just be careful uh, when you when you consume all these 30, 35 Almond Joys in one setting. Maybe that's the theme next year for your party, cocaine bear. That would be good. <laughs> uh, we also, you know, last year I bought all these candy bars, the full side, size one. I was trying to be good in the neighborhood. Got no kids, Sal. Ended up eating all the candy bars, as you can tell. So uh, don't get really? trapped uh, with a bunch of over candy because you have to end up eating it. So that's a, you got to have kids. Yeah. You'll, you'll lose weight. <laughs> you, you won't eat exactly. all the candy in that case. Right. Yeah, now we'll sure. be running around 
everywhere. Uh, now mm-hmm. let's play my favorite game. It's officially that time. Over underreactions. We ask you crazy things, Sal, or sometimes sensible things. And you tell us if it's an overreaction, mm-hmm. an underreaction, a proper reaction. Let's start here. I say to you, a game winning Hail Mary, like the one we just saw with the Commanders, is more exciting than a walk off Grand Slam, as we just saw in the World Series. Over underreaction. What say you? Well, all right. So we have to, uh, of equal importance, right? So a week eight. Hail Mary between two teams. One of them is going to make the playoffs. Mm-hmm. Isn't the same as the Freeman. I'm still going to go, you know, even like a playoff Hail Mary is great in football. We saw one with Rogers, right? Um, we saw one with, uh, with Russell Wilson, but I think the walk-off slam is just something else. Even though it was game one, uh, poor Mikey meatballs was at that game Oof. as a Yankee fan. Still is going to be scarred for life. And I just think it actually brought some fans into the mix who maybe weren't necessarily had their sights set on baseball, the World Series this year. So I don't also, though, Hail Mary is a little flukish. You got to admit. Yeah, right? it's absolutely. Like the, Especially when the ball yeah. gets tipped like that. Uh, yeah. I think baseball, there's a, there's a way bigger of a moment. You get the bat flip. You know what I mean? There's a bigger stage. So I think that's a major overreaction. Even Also, though the Hail Mary, Mary you're still, as is, is with any football play, you're waiting six or seven seconds for a flag to appear somewhere. <laughs> right. Whereas Freeman, there was no doubt. There was nothing. Mm-hmm. There wasn't going to be a illegal motion or false start in the batter's box. It was a home run. That was that no fan interference. No, nothing. Just uh, a beautiful moment in baseball. And it's what this series needed, even though we didn't have much competition there. Uh, Next up, Sal, I say to you, we don't need to see the giants, the New York giants to be specific play at night again, this decade, Uh, a decade ban is what we're saying here over under reaction. Underreaction. <laughs> enough is enough. Tate. Poor Daniel Harry. Jones is now one in fifteen at night. Uh, these owners are rich, can't they? Can't the Giants owners bribe the schedule makers? Say we just don't want anything to do with prime time. I don't know what it is with Daniel Jones. Maybe there was something when he was growing up as a kid. Something happened in the dark. He's <laughs> invaded by. He was sacked by aliens as a nine-year-old mm-hmm. or something. I have no idea. The boogeyman. Not sure what it is. I just don't need to see them again. Yeah, that boogeyman is actually John Mara, and he is sitting up (laughs) in the dark because he has not been able to sleep ever since he let Saquon go. So uh, (laughs) there's a lot happening with the Giants, and it is not good stuff. So, again, we'll ban him for a decade. Let's talk about a team where things are going well. The Detroit Lions, Sal, are the best team in the NFL. Uh, What say you, over or under reaction? Yeah, I might, I might say underreaction mm-hmm. here because the Bills and Lions, I'm pr- pretty solid preseason pick for me. If there's any, it's that one. Bills, Lions to meet in the Super Bowl. Lions are beating the crap out of teams. I got their numbers here. 172 points in the last four games. Goff has had like a handful of incomplete passes over that time. And by the way, their defense hasn't suffered greatly without Hutchinson. That was the key, right? They were going to be one-dimensional. Not necessarily the case flying Special teams all over the place. Uh, Still a long way to go. They have the Packers this week, but not a lot to hate about this Detroit team. Yeah, they're actually very likable, too. And uh, Jared Goff doing his media tour right now. Just saw him on with Bill Belichick. So uh, they're checking a lot of boxes up there in Detroit, and that was a tortured fan base, a tortured franchise, and it's nice to see them turn things around. Uh, A guy who's been tortured for the past couple of years, Sal, Russell Wilson is currently Mm. a better NFL quarterback than starting Jets quarterback Aaron Rodgers. Over or under reaction, what say you? I'm going to say underreaction. He's actually been pretty good, right? You know, we can say what we want about the Giants and Monday night, but the pass rush is for real, and he kind of held it in check. He had a couple moments there, which were iffy, but he's throwing the long ball well. And listen, what what are we comparing him to Aaron Rodgers? You know, Simmons presented me with a list. He's like, I'm going to keep naming quarterbacks, and you tell me (laughs) when to stop when I've heard I've announced one that's not as good as Aaron Rodgers. I think we went – Almost exactly 16 in. I think I had him between Bo Nix and uh, Bo Derek or something. I'm somewhere in there. I'm not sure. So he is at the middle of the pack, and I think that might be generous at this point for A-Rod. Yeah, poor A-Rod, and uh, luckily for him, the other A-Rod, he's doing a good job uh, in the World Series calling these games, so yeah. there's hope for the future. Maybe he can turn things around. Uh, <laughs> next up, Sal, I say to you, your Dallas Cowboys will never oh. get out from under the 49ers shadow until they make a big splash and hire their head coach, Kyle Shanahan over under reaction. How do you feel about that move? Uh, I'm going to say overreaction. Okay. I like Shanahan, but I mean, we, we might just have to trade the entire team for the 49ers and just uh, switch up the unit, just a, a yeah. big, a mass uniform swap. You know what I'm saying? Take 53 man roster, but yeah, I mean, we're just going to see Montana to Clark to start every one of those games. And then we had the two playoff games and then this one, like, we just cannot avoid them. And the Cowboys, Cowboys are a mess right now, Tate. I'm not going to lie. They're not a Carolina Panthers mess, 
but they're a mess. Yeah, we need Joe Montana and Troy Aikman to play like a golf match on TNT to see who. That's it. <laughs> if Day the Cowboys can get a win, uh, that's the way to do it. Uh, <laughs> let's talk about this guy, Jameis Winston, Sal. Uh, I say yeah. to you, Jameis Winston starting for the Browns is the no dub moment of 2024 over a hundred reaction. No dub. That's uh, a lot more fun without uh, no, Deshaun Watson out there, of course. Yeah, no dub. The no duh moment of the year. I'm going to say overreaction because I think the no duh moment of the year is the jujitsu instructor impregnating <laughs> Giselle two months, three months after the roast. I mean, that, you yeah. had to know that was coming. No but, duh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've been screaming about Jameis for for months, like even in, into last year a little bit. I mean, there's I don't know. They have like seven games, six out of seven games between Flacco and Winston, 300 yards or more, and then none in the last 29. For Watson, like, I don't get it. I know you want to get some value out of your big ticket item, but if your BMW, brand new shiny BMW, is being recalled every three months, maybe go with the Subaru Outback you've been driving since uh, 2003. And we, It'll work. And we can add, a, add another name to uh, the jersey, you know, starting with Tim Couch. Now we can right. put Winston under Watson, so we get another name at this point. That's a and, lot of uh, names. Jamie Wins- James Winston did say that he is a great quarterback when he makes great decisions, so uh, I think mm-hmm. that's good for Cleveland fans to hear. Uh, I say to you, Sal, after he retires, Kirk Cousins will have a fruitful career as a Christian rapper. Uh, we'll take a look at this clip right here in case you missed it. So, Sal, you see that. What are your thoughts on Cousins? Uh, this is incredible I stuff. I love it. We fight. No cap. We walk in the trap. He's like the Dr. Seuss of mediocre NFL quarterbacks. Yeah. He really is. Or the Lorax of Hot Lana. Now, it, it does seem like he's setting himself up for some further career. I would like him to do, maybe he could be a color commentator, you know, quarterback when he retires mm. and just like wrap uh, all his analysis. That would be fun to watch, wouldn't it? Yeah, I did feel like this was a bit of pandering to Atlanta, but I'll let it slide. Uh, he is the quarterback of the Falcons. <laughs> so I think it's a good move. Next up, Sal, Bronny James will end up with fewer total points than the Detroit <laughs> Pistons will have wins this season. Kate Cunningham playing some good basketball right now. Bronny not playing much basketball at all over or under reaction. So uh, one team has Cade Cunningham. The other one has Jim Cunningham. As far as I'm concerned <laughs> right. in the uh, Lakers, that's an inside ringer joke right there. But um, well, I think it has to be an overreaction, right? Cause they're going to ship LeBron to the G league. I don't know if they could ship the whole Pistons team to the G league, even though they're Oh, and four or whatever. Uh, I, I also think it, that he's going to get some garbage time on Christmas, right? They play Christmas Day, and it's going to be father and son, and it's going to be a, a totally fabricated, mm-hmm. wonderful, staged and a NBA holiday moment. Yeah, and if you go to FanDuel right now, Sal, you can look up Bronny Specials. That's right. They have Bronny James Specials, and then the method of his first basket, you can get odds on a layup, a dunk, a three-point field goal. You can also get if Bronny mm. assists LeBron James on a basket or if LeBron assists Bronny on his first basket. You can get that at plus 200. So a lot of Bronny specials out there uh, in case you've been looking. I know you've been waiting for these. So uh, Give me the no, Fandle. <laughs> I want no on all of those. Give me that option. I'll pay minus 10,000 right. on, on the uh, two three-pointers well, or more, whatever it is. Jonte Porter, he uh, created the new rule, so we can't bet the unders. So I uh, think to Jonte true. Porter, we're not going to be able to do that. Last yep. over-under reaction, Sal. Nephew Kyle, he upstaged you this year at your own Halloween party. Uh, you guys both win as Matt Foley. We got a picture right here back-to-back yeah. years that you and Kyle have gone as the exact same thing at your own Halloween party are you getting concerned or, or do I you think this is purposeful? he did that last yeah. year I, I, yeah, I does, told him it was bad taste you can't do it back-to-back years does he have my bedroom bugged when I'm <laughs> discussing this with my wife I, I don't like so. this and uh yeah we have a picture that was me and Kyle and our friend Don Barris's girlfriend Mary Jane she's crazy too but uh <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm you're not supposed to upstage the host Tate, right. right. I mean, he should have seen I was dressed as Matt Foley and he should have gone to Target and become, I don't know, put together a Debbie Downer costume. <laughs> SNL was the theme, you see. Mm. So he could have been Debbie Downer. I think, you know, get a cowbell. I think they have him at Home Depot. What do you think you're doing, Kyle? It was the I best. It. He asked you even before the party what you were going to be. You told him Matt Foley. He said, me too. And he did not back down. He had just a moment where he was you're like, right. yeah, yeah. I'm, he said, I already bought 
<laughs> yeah. You know what? I'm going to send him a bill for everything he drank. It's, uh, it comes to like $619. I told Good. him next year he should call you, ask you what you're going to be for Halloween, then show up as that, uh, <laughs> and then make sure that he knows third time's the charm. So uh... He's not invited. It's not going to be an issue. <laughs> there you go. Uh, let's call up the Riverboat captain, and let's do some prop culture, Sal. We got a fun question in honor of Halloween. Who is the scariest athlete in the history of sports? We got the odds here. Mike Tyson at 3-1 to one is the favorite. We got the Undertaker, of course, seven to one. Ronda Rousey, ten to one. OJ Simpson, twenty five to one. And the Whoa. field at even odds. How? Who do you like here? Scary. I forgot athlete. about OJ. Yeah, he was <laughs> right. kind of scary. Uh, you know, Dennis Rodman could be added yeah. to that list too. Just his That's appearance, right? With the the, the, the crazy hair colors yeah. and everything, and the piercings. Uh, the fact that he's got the North Korean nuclear codes, that's kind of <laughs> scary. But I'm going to go with Iron Mike right there at the mm-hmm. top of the list, the most ferocious puncher of my lifetime, I'll see. And then, like, he would routinely, after fights, talk about eating his opponent's baby. He's he's <laughs> bitten his opponent's ears. Yeah. And then to add to it, he gets a terrifying, terrifying face tattoo. So hopefully all that is enough to make Jake Paul what is jock strap in a couple of weeks? Yeah. Iron Mike's my pick. As you're explaining this, I think he is the obvious pick, even <laughs> though he is the favorite. I think he's the one you got to go with. I mean, yeah, Lawrence Taylor maybe uh, could be another yeah. name I was going to throw out there. But the more you explain Mike Tyson, I think Iron Mike, and we get to watch him, like you said, on Netflix. So uh, scariest yeah. athlete. He's still got the Nothing crown. against him. Yeah. Still a great, <laughs> great, great dude. Lots of fun. Come on the show next week. Lots of fun. Hopefully we get him on Cousin Sal's winning weekend very soon. <laughs> uh, we're going to take a quick break. and we come back, we got more with Cousin Sal. Some line look aheads some track to the futures we'll see you on the other side of the break Welcome back to Through the Ringer. I'm your host, Tate Frazier, and we are still here with Cousin Sal. And Sal, we got some fun games and some fun track to the futures to, to work with this week. We're going to start with our first line look ahead here, and we're going to look at Thursday night football. We're still feeling okay with Thursday night football, right? Generally speaking, uh, I know I've been talking down on it, but got a little bit better last Thursday. It feels like it's trending in the right direction, right? Do we feel better about it? Yeah, now it's going to trend in a whole other dire- <laughs> the direction you were talking about right. earlier. Yeah, well, which is not so good. Well, the reason why is that the Jets are playing yet again uh, in a standalone game, so we get to watch them yet again. Uh, yes. The Houston Texans taking on the Jets. Jets minus one and a half in this one. The total at 42 and a half. So Vegas, they just can't quit the Jets, Sal. What about you? Who do you like in this game? Well, first of all, it's on Halloween, right? Mm-hmm. So um, I, I think Spooky. the holidays should take a page out of MLB's book and try to avoid NFL games as bad as the Jets are and as much as little as we want to see them, right? They should they should run away from it. But this is actually good in a way because Aaron Rodgers likes to give away ayahuasca flavored apple slices so that's good that he won't be home to do that for kids but i tate i i I don't know i went on guess the lines i thought the texans would be a three-point favorite the jets were a one and a half point favorite it flipped by the time we did guess the lines to the texans being one and a half point favorite and now people are betting the jets this (laughs) is the the raddest of ratty lines i've seen in a while a two and six team hosting a six and two team the Jets 0 and 5 against the spread in the last five and two and six against the spread in their last eight at home. A rat line if I ever saw it take. And it does feel like the Jets, we've been waiting for this moral victory game where, you know, Devontae Adams scores a touchdown and Aaron Rodgers has his I told you so kind of moment, right? And it didn't happen in the past two games. So right. maybe it feels like third time's the charm. Maybe it's that they're due in this game. Maybe that's the calculus behind the scenes. But yeah, it's a very ratty line, very confusing line, and no digs for the Texans. Maybe that's factored into it a little bit too. They're going to be a little bit different without the weapons uh, that Stroud has been able to play with so far this season. But there are some prop bets that you like in this game. Uh, What do you like, Sal? Yeah, so no dig. So you might think this is dumb because he has to throw the ball somewhere, Mm -hmm. CJ Stroud. I'm going to go Tank Dell under 50 and a half 58 and a half receiving yards. He is uh, take one of the more frustrating fantasy players. Somehow he's on like three of my leagues. Uh, he I benched him last week when he actually scored, but I'm going to go under 58 and a half. I know they're shorthanded. No Collins, no digs, but tanks gone under this number in eight of his last nine games. He's averaged 31 receiving yards. Even with the touchdown last week, didn't pull in a lot. He had 35. He's got other receivers. They throw to Mechie. They throw the woods. I like it under here. 58 and a half. 
for Tank Dell. Yeah, I feel like the tank is doing a lot of work for Tank Dell. Uh, it sounds yeah. good, it's provocative, but the results aren't always there. And uh, <laughs> if his name was Tate Dell, I don't think he would be getting the same fantasy Ooh, love sound, is what I would you say. Try it. I got a TNF prop for you. I like Aaron Rodgers, rushing touchdown, uh, plus 1,300. Hasn't done it in a couple of seasons. Obviously didn't play much last year, uh, but he has had some rushing touchdowns in his career. And I do feel like this is his momentum play where he's like, wow. just line him up, QB sneak. Burt Reynolds in longest yard. He comes off and says, I'm going to go get us the touchdown, boys. If you guys don't want to block from me, I'm going to go get it myself. So uh, plus 1,300. Let's take a big swing for Aaron Rodgers All right, well, on Halloween. That. Yeah, very yeah, good, good. A lot of luck, uh, <laughs> a lot wish of luck. for that. But, I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking now with this Tank Dell thing, you're right. If he was – you said Tate Dell. If Tank Dell was Hank Dell, yeah, which sounds more like an insurance salesman mm-hmm. in Des Moines, I don't know if he's drafted as high as he is. Right. But anyway, we can move on. Yeah, Hank yeah. Dell would be like a writer on The Simpsons. Uh, he would Hank not Dell, be, yeah. nice to see you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a guy you see at your 20-year reunion. You're like, all right, I'm going to go on the other side. Oh, that's right. I love Hank Dell. He's such a nice guy. <laughs> uh, let's track to the future here, Sal. We're going to look at the NFC East winner. Uh, we got the Eagles as the favorite, obviously, at minus 120. Commander sitting right there with a tasty plus 140. What do you like for the NFC East? Do you like making him play for the Commanders? Uh, who do you like overall in this division? That's it. My team's out of it. We're not <laughs> no, even going to list the Cowboys. No, I, no I, eight. I, I don't. I don't want to break your heart. <laughs> it's broken. You can't. Uh, plus eight fifty for the Cowboys. Unfortunately, I think it's going to be tough for us to get ten wins. And the Eagles are starting to look like what the Eagles are supposed to. I predicted the Commanders would make the playoffs back in august so that looks good but the eagles you're right are in decent shape at minus 120 barkley averaging six yards a carry they're able to put games away with uh that you know that's a that's a huge huge benefit there they have the jags this week they still have your panthers in five division games they'll likely win three of those so that's 10 that's that's enough and Big Dom and Nick Sirianni could start kissing each other on the face because they're going to win a division. Yeah, battle. and John Mara still awake, uh, still watching all <laughs> this happen. Very upset about Saquon Barkley being so good for the Eagles. This is his right. actual nightmare, and uh, it is a nightmare for the rest of the NFC East as uh, Nick Sirianni looks like he's on his way to winning the NFC East yet again. So uh, something to keep an eye on. Let's talk about the Chargers, Sal. This is a fun one. To make the playoffs, yes, is minus 148. No, plus 120 right now. They're sitting in the seventh spot, so they would make the playoffs. So they're currently on the right side of the line. Uh, what do you like here as a play? Do you buy into the Chargers? Uh, very boring team, very different than what we saw early on in Herbert's career. Isn't it weird, right? Because you're a season ticket holder right. or something. I don't know. You have like five <laughs> games, but you could tell everybody you're a season ticket holder. It sounds but, good. Uh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> well, I don't know. It, it, it sounds better, that's for sure. But, you know, you had the Herbert. You mentioned it. You had the Herbert offense, mm-hmm. right, uh, with bad coaches. Um, but they were exciting, but they never won. And now you have this slow, lethargic offense, um, you know, of injuries on, on both sides. But And that's a team that's winning. So it is very strange that Harbaugh has stepped in played Harbaugh football. But I was looking at this, Tate, and really who else is there in the AFC? If you could come to terms with the fact that the East and the South are only going to have one playoff team, then either the AFC North has to get four in or three in plus Denver for the Chargers not to make it. Anyway, it's all, I'll, I'll send you a diagram, <laughs> but it's there. Uh, it's going to come down, I think, to Denver against LA out here in SoFi in late December, but I would take the minus 150 at this point. I think the Chargers do make it. That's going to be around Christmas time, so that could be a yeah. big gift for uh, all the Charger season ticket holders like myself, or at least you mm-hmm. know the ones that have some games. So they can uh, get a nice uh, playoff run there for the Chargers. And I will say it does feel like a trap game this weekend going to Cleveland – Facing yeah. Jameis Winston, that feels like a loss. You know what I mean? This is, uh, I feel like Jameis Winston might have like a nice three week wave of wins where everyone's back on the bandwagon. So the Chargers might get caught in that buzzsaw, could hurt them late in the year. But uh, like you said, they have a chance against the Broncos. Still tough. I think nine and eight gets that seven seed, though. Right. Maybe in both conferences, but for sure the AFC. Yeah, the AFC is not very good this year. Uh, it feels no. like no one's really talking about that because the top is really good, of course. Uh, now let's talk yeah. about something that you are an absolute expert in, and that's college football. You have been killing 
these upset specials. Uh, week one, you had Syracuse. Week two, Arizona State. Then you had Michigan mm-hmm. State. Then you had Houston last week over Utah. You're winning people a lot of money on this show, Sal, and you understand you have the uh, foresight to see these upset specials. And what do you yes, like this I do. week in college Yes, football? I do. So if you put these four together that I've hit over the last month, Mm -hmm. you get plus 5340. Now, that's just a number I could throw out there. But if I could give you an example of what plus 5340 is, Tate, if you wager (laughs) $12,500,000 on a parlay with my four upsets and rolled it over each week, you would have six hundred and sixty-seven million five hundred thousand dollars. Oh my gosh! I mean, that's a lot. Talk about million-dollar picks, right there. That's uh... yeah, that's the real million-dollar picks. That's <laughs> like real that. stuff. I'm taking a big swing here. Pitt plus two twenty over SMU. Although I don't know why this should be a big swing. Pitt's undefeated. SMU seven and one. If you read into the line, it looks like SMU is going to shellac them. They're going to smack the Panthers around. They do crush teams at home, but the Mustangs turn the ball over six times against Duke, and that's not going to work against Pittsburgh. The defense is going to make them play, uh, pay and play if uh, they're that lazy. Eli Holstein gets it done pretty much mistake-free all year for Pitt. So Panthers remain undefeated, and I get five upset wins, Tate. Let's oh, do it. Come goodness. on and join me. Yeah, Who do you have? More millions. Uh, you don't want to take <laughs> what I've had the past few weeks. We were both successful week one ever since then, Sal. I've been on a downturn, to say the least. But this week, I'm going to go to the Big Ten, and I'm going to go with Illinois. Uh, take it on Minnesota. They're, they're at home in this game. Minnesota coming to town, and they have a plus 125 line, Sal. I have not been the biggest believer in Illinois football, but North Carolina did beat Minnesota. Minnesota. I have watched Minnesota. Mm. I'm not very impressed with who they are. I know they've gotten a little bit better over the past couple of weeks, but I think Illinois gets the job done here. And uh, to get plus money for them, I think that's a good win. So you know what I like. Don't bet that. me and though. Bet Sal. No, I'm gonna. Well, I have six hundred sixty-seven million dollars <laughs> here. I'll I could sprinkle a little on Illinois. Give me a break. Come on, sprinkle something. Uh, <laughs> shout out to Jerry Colangelo, Illinois legend. Uh, a lot of Illinois legends out there. Uh, but Pitt plus two twenty, Illinois plus one twenty-five. College football upsets specials. Sal is the king of it. Go check it out. We got another line look ahead here, Sal. Keeping it in college football. Will someone other than Dylan Gabriel, the quarterback of Oregon at plus 230, win the Heisman Trophy? Uh, Obviously, your son has seen him up close in person. Archie, your thoughts on Dylan Gabriel and the Heisman race in general? I'm going to say that someone else does win only because these numbers are jumping around every week. Like two weeks ago, it was Cam Ward at 2-1, to one, and yep. Ashton Jonte at 2-1. to one. I'm like, all right, one of those two is definitely going to win. And then Jonte had the nerve to rush for only 128 yards last week. <laughs> so he's moved to like fourth in the rankings, and Travis Hunter is up. So as much as I'm rooting for this Oregon team because uh, I pay a ridiculous amount in tuition for my kid to go there, I think they get tripped up in a dumb game. Maybe not at Michigan this week, but maybe at Wisconsin in a few weeks. And if that happens, Dylan Gabriel has moved out of the top spot. But it is it is really jam packed up there. Yeah, and you got Coach Prime who is uh, you know promoting Travis Hunter as the unequivocal best player in college football. Yeah. No questions to be asked. So I do feel like the campaigning is going to help Travis Hunter. I think if you just talk to the general fan, they know Travis Hunter. And I do feel like, you know, the field, which would include Travis Hunter, all signs are pointing that way. It's, it's not Colorado fair. Travis me. Hunter's got Dion. He's got Elon Musk. He's got Tony Hinchcliffe. He's got all of them. He's, he's got, got everybody. He's got everything yeah. going. MSG, all types of stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, speaking of MSG, let's talk about basketball. Track to the future, rookie of the year, which is a very fascinating race this year. Last year, not so much. Wimbenyama, it was a foregone conclusion. Uh, but if we look at the odds now, Zach Eady is the favorite at plus 490. Zachary Risache, who was the number one pick, plus 550. Stefan Castle with the Spurs, Don Connect, Alexander Saar, all in the mix right there. But no cl- no clear cut after week one. Uh, nobody really standing out, Sal. So who do you like, and uh, where's your money kind of trend towards with Rookie of the Year? Well, that's a nice way of what you you said before our show. You said these guys stink. (laughs) And now you're saying no clear-cut favorite. But I like the way you said it before. Well, Edie's fouling out. It's interesting, right? He didn't foul out ever Ever. at Purdue. Actually, one time. He fouled out of one game early Was it? Yeah, one game. But he, like, tripped. It wasn't even his fault or something. But (laughs) he gets six fouls in the pros. And, uh, and he went out immediately, and he's flirting with four or five every game. So I'm not going to pick him. It's not fun to take the favorite anyway. Mm-hmm. I had uh, last week I liked um, Alex Saar at 10-1. to 1. It went down to plus 850. I'm not sure why because his numbers haven't been – terrific it's 12.6 boards two blocks the other day followed by a not so great shooting night but seven nine and two but 
He's getting between 23 and 30 minutes because Washington stinks so bad. They're 25 to one to make the playoffs. So why not see what this kid has and put him on uh, for at least half the game. Uh, so that's what I'm doing. I think the number two pick overall is in contention at plus 850 for rookie of the year. Yeah, the NBA wants him to be good. He's going to get the opportunities. He's going to get the minutes. He's going to get the shots. He's also got Bub Carrington next to him. So if there's a dark mm-hmm. horse guy, uh, Bub's been playing better. Maybe he could be in the mix. You get great odds on him. But if you're just watching the Wizards, you can find someone to bet on. You can spin the narrative yeah. to go there. So I like Alex Sar. I'm going to go with Dalton Connect. Uh, the media already loves JJ, even though JJ hates the media. Uh, he has gone to the other mm-hmm. side, and now he's yelling back at them, even though he was just on the media side six months ago. It's an incredible <laughs> Uh, 180, uh, but he's going to be getting Dalton Connect in the right spots. He's going to be getting him shots, and uh, you know, being in LA is going to help, and LeBron loving him is going to help. So Dalton Connect is at plus 700. I feel like some value there, and uh, the Lakers bump will get him to uh, to the conversation. So, so I like uh, that. You know. I'm going to again reach into my 667 million and uh, <laughs> right. put him on our two rookie of the year choices. Reach into the pot. Uh, last thing, Sal Tate debate. I'll throw this your way. This is, you know, close and near and dear to my heart. I started the season wearing a bag on my head because of the Carolina Panthers. <laughs> now I'm talking about him again in the Tate debate. But I say to you, Sal, don't ever publicly complain about someone running up the score against you uh, in any sport, anything that you do. Don't publicly do it. Now, you can privately do it. You can say it to the person directly that you're upset. But when you publicly do it, as J.C. Horn did, uh, it right. lends itself to Sean Payton be able to say things like, play better. Uh, if you don't want us to run up the score, do something about it. It just makes it look even worse. So uh, Tate debate this week. Don't ever publicly complain about it. Just uh, let it wash over you and privately make some things happen uh, to get rid of this. What say well, you, Yeah, you've heard me say, if you don't want anyone running up the score, Mm -hmm. what do I say? Stop them, right? I I did say that? Yeah, I think I did say (laughs) that. Wow, I'm I'm, I'm, I'm more of a genius than I give myself (laughs) credit for. Also, um, the other thing is, like, they have six losses by 14 or more points this year. They have 13 losses of Mm 14-plus in the last year and a half. So is every head coach an a-hole or maybe should they look for another solution? Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe a new coach, maybe a new yeah. quarterback, maybe a new owner. There's a lot of new there, Yikes. Uh, but uh, yeah, don't complain about the score being run out on you. Cause it's not going to be a good look either way. Sal. So uh, I'm sad now, now that I talk about the Panthers, but uh, let's turn it back well, up. You don't have to, this is your like, <laughs> I know segment where you're, I did you, know, you can make it any debate you want. We could have talked. Uh, there's I'm really, enjoy against. There's Niles really no debate. It's just, you know, it's no, just I'm not sad. Debate you. It's just sad. Uh, <laughs> Uh, where can we find all your work, Sal? And then we'll let you go. It's enjoy sad the that I have day. to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah right. against all odds on the Ringer Podcast Network. You got the Ringer pregame show on Sunday right here on FanDuel TV and Cousin Sal's winning weekend this Friday morning. Yes, Matthew McConaughey will be joining. Matthew us. McConaughey. Wow, that is uh, a list to say the least. And uh, all right, all right, Sal, you're the best. We appreciate you coming to the show. On the other side of the break, we got Nora Princiati joining us. Stay right there. Welcome back to Through the Ringer. Joining us now, she's back on the show, Nora Princiati. Nora, good to see you. Hey, Tate. It's good to see you. Well, we have a lot to get to, Nora. Uh, You're my favorite NFL person to talk to. There's a lot of big topics every single week, a lot of drama, and it usually starts in New York, and it usually starts with the New York Jets in particular. Aaron Rodgers has had a very dark week, so dark, in fact, that he is back in the darkness. That is correct. He is uh, bringing his teammates Uh, His coaches, the owners, everybody, they're all in the darkness. What are your thoughts on where the Jets are currently and the darkness in general with this team? I mean, the darkness thing, which (laughs) I I think what you're talking about is that uh, I think Jeff Ulbrich said that the team was in the darkness (laughs) and then it felt like a darkness retreat Rogers joke. And then someone asked him about it at the press conference. and He was like, well, I've been in the darkness, man. (laughs) Yeah. I'm like, I don't. Like, why are, why are we doing this? Like, why are we talking about this? Why are we making jokes about your darkness retreat? This team is two and six. Like they just lost to, they lost to this Patriots team, which to me, it was just such an encapsulation of, of where the jets are. Right. Because it's been decades. They have been kind of, you know, in the shadow of new England. And then finally it feels like the script is flipped. It's this Jets team with the highest expectations since whenever. Patriots team with the lowest expectations since whenever. And then they come out of this game and they're both two and six. And it's it's to me, it's just like 
you went out on a limb, mm-hmm. got Rogers, made all the moves he wanted to make, and it was supposed to be this just like short term, let's just win some games. It has been a tough road in New York over the last several decades. Uh, mortgage the future, who cares? And now it's like they're not even going to get anything out of it. I think the season for them is over. And you just start to look toward the future and go, okay, how are they going to get themselves out of this because of the resources that they've spent to put together this team in the short term that isn't producing anything? Yeah, it's uh, so you're saying this is not the Dark Knight Rises. This is not Aaron Rodgers coming out of the abyss. Uh, I don't think we're getting out of the (laughs) darkness. Okay, I'm just making sure because I feel like that's the script that he's still trying to write. It does feel like we're trending towards the end of the road, but for Aaron Rodgers, you never know where the road will go. Let's talk about rookies who the road is just beginning. Uh, Commanders, Bears, we got the Hail Mary, the Hail Maryland. Everyone's talking about it, of course. Caleb Williams versus Jaden Daniels. Do you feel like this was a moment we're going to be talking about in five, ten years, just about these guys. Like, are they going to be cosmically connected forever? I, it feels that way, right? Yeah. And and even if you talk about something that we're going to be talking about in five years, whether that has to do with the relationship between these two first and second overall pick quarterbacks in Washington, the Hail Maryland, I like that. Let's let's make sure that sticks. Just to have that moment is like the biggest football moment in Washington since RG3, but just from the Washington perspective, like this, this is going to be a thing that people tell their kids about. I feel like, yeah, it does feel like it has that sort of gravitas to the moment. Does it matter that it was a bad game? Uh, do you think that we'll talk about this game? No, in five years and we'll, no way. We'll forget about that. Who okay. Cares? Yeah, who cares? I mean, it wasn't like, it wasn't, <laughs> it could have been a worse game, okay. right? Like, it, Washington found various ways to move the ball. I mean, even like even Caleb Williams, I felt like had a really tough start, just couldn't get anything going um, really until those last couple of drives. And then all of a sudden you did even with him, like you kind of felt like there was a moment where he turned it on and it, and it makes you feel like you've got a guy, which then I think makes the ending for the commanders that much more satisfying. So I didn't. I don't know. I didn't think it was as bad of a game as everybody said. Okay, good. I, I just wanted to make sure. I, you know, sometimes the endings, they kind of change the the narrative of what the game actually was. But I think it's good. Tyreek Stevenson, he just wants to make sure people forget his name, right? I think that's his big goal. He wants it to be the Jane Daniels throw and the moment, not him talking to the fans. So for Tyreek Stevenson's sake, we'll make sure to navigate this and talk about Jane Daniels. We'll talk about the positives. Uh, let's talk about the positives of the NFC North, a very fascinating division, a lot of good teams. If we look at the odds right now, the Lions are the favorites, uh, minus 130, Packers plus 300, Vikings plus 360, and then the Bears outside looking in. But still, you know, they're playing good football, plus 1,800. What do you like about the NFC North? How do you feel about the Lions? Are the Lions the real deal? Do you buy the hype of Detroit? Sort of. Okay. Are they the real deal? Sort of. I mean, uh, look, I am I am on the record as a Packers believer. They are the team that, to me, I kind of want to ride with over the course of the year, but that doesn't mean that I don't think the Lions are legit. I mean, I I still want to see this defense without Aiden Hutchinson perform well against a good offense. If it's fair for me to say that I'm a believer in both, I would like to do that. But if you ask me to pick um, I, I'd, I'd still go with Green Bay. Let's talk about the NFC West. Very much up for grabs right now. The Niners are the favorites, minus 110. Got the Cardinals in the mix, the Seahawks and the Rams. Rams got a big win against the Vikings. If McCaffrey comes back and is any you know version of himself that we've seen before, does it feel like a foregone conclusion the 49ers will handle this division? Or are we buying the hype of the Rams potentially? Maybe the Seahawks, maybe Kyler Murray. How do you feel about this division? So the it's the... The Christian McCaffrey, what he looks like when he comes back is the big question to me, because it sounds like from everything I've heard and and from all the reports we've seen, it seems like they're going to get him back. They're expecting to get him back. But when you talk about something like the, the Achilles tendon, like you don't know what the explosiveness, what the burst is going to be like, how he's going to be managing that on a week to week basis. And he is such a critical piece of that offense. And I think we've seen that it does, um, really take a step back without him, which is something that in the Brock Purdy era there, like Purdy getting into that lineup coincided with that trade, basically. So Mm -hmm. we've never really known what that's like. Um, 
So I, I, I'm cautiously optimistic for San Francisco. I think on paper, they are still the best team in that division. Um, but I do think that there's a, the, the big what if to me is not if CMC gets back in there. It's just what version of himself is he? And Cooper Cup just came back for the Rams, scored a touchdown in his first game back. Is he one of those guys where we go from how many guys are going to get traded for the Rams to now are they a dark horse contender in this division? Do you think Cooper Cup can have that sort of difference for this team where the Rams are in the conversation again? I mean, it does feel like this is like this is what the Rams do, mm -hmm. right? Like it, it feels like such a Ramsey moment. I had frankly written them off. I thought that at the beginning of the season, just given the number of injuries they had, particularly on that offensive line and and in that offense as a whole, I just thought this is too much. Um, this is too much for Sean McVay, Stafford. Uh, they can't overcome this, but. If you tell me that like you've seen the future and the Rams are going to figure it out and they're going to, you know, get a wild card or something or even win the division, uh, I would kind of shrug my shoulders. Yeah. You'd say it's expected at this point with Matthew Stafford. They call his passes long handoffs because that's how much they hit him right in the pocket. So uh, I like what the offense looks like for the Rams, and I like Sean McVay. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we got some more conversations to talk about in the NFL and beyond. And we get to talk about Bill Belichick with Norris. So we'll be right back. Welcome back to Through the Ringer. We're here with Nora. And Nora, we have talked through some of the biggest headlines in football that are actually happening right now in the NFL. But now I want to extrapolate out a little bit. Let's talk about some uh, some narrative storylines, some big picture things, some big characters in the life of the NFL. And I want to talk about Bill Belichick, a guy that you covered for quite some time. So I'll ask you a simple question. Will Bill Belichick coach in the NFL next season? He's doing a great job as a media guy. He's uh, everywhere. I see him everywhere. He makes you like him. But uh, I feel like I need him coaching football. Do you think that's going to happen next year I'm, I'm like a real skeptic about this okay right <laughs> okay. just because i don't really know what has happened between last season last off season and and right now or potentially um in in january or beyond that should change the way that nfl owners at least those ones who had an opening to fill responded to him being available last year he has the exact same resume now, plus a few media gigs that he did last season. There were a number of openings last season, and he really only got interest from one team that didn't ultimately hire him. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's just, it's a little hard for me to to figure out what has changed. Do you think there's a world in which like Bill Belichick just coaches some high school football team does all of his media obligations and you know what I mean? Just kind of like does it off the beaten path. Like he still wants to coach, but not at this high of a level. Or do you think he's just fully gone media? You know what I mean? Cause he does seem like he likes I the think media. He wants yeah. to coach. Okay. I think he wants to coach. Um, would he go coach a high school team if he was <laughs> sure that he wasn't getting an NFL opportunity? I don't know. Probably. It seems like something that he would enjoy. Um, I do think that he wants to be back in the, back in the league. And probably what he's doing now, which I agree with you, it does seem like he enjoys it, seems like the right thing to do if you're just sort of trying to trying to stay engaged with everything, stay visible, have opportunities where you break down a play and you seem really smart and you have all that Bill Belichick experience to, to pull from. You know, you're hoping that somebody clips that and sends it to Jeff Lurie right. or Jerry Jones or whoever it is. It's like, ah, oh, man, Belichick still got it. I do feel like Mark Davis might be one of those guys that wants to see that clip. And maybe Tom Brady, uh, a new <laughs> small-time owner of the of the Raiders. I don't know. You mentioned Dallas, though. You mentioned Yeah, I don't, I don't know if that helps or hurts, yeah, it honestly. Might, it, like, might hurt. I, I, it might hurt. It might hurt. We've seen those two hug it out, but I do think that there is like a – Hugging it out and agreeing to work together again feel different yeah, to me. Yeah, and it is true. Like, uh, Belichick kind of just took his spot on the Let's Go podcast, so he kind of just stepped in there for Brady. Who knows how things play out? But Jerry Jones is always in the mix, and I do want to talk about Dallas. We obviously have the McCarthy lame duck contract situation. They look like they're going to be moving towards a different future. Dak is going to be a part of that. CeeDee Lamb will be a part of that um, as it currently is constituted. But what are your thoughts on Dallas? Where does Jerry go? Uh 
what's the big splash play for Jerry? Or is it just kind of, this is who we are. This is where we stand. The big splash play for Jerry. <laughs> Jerry doesn't make a big splash play. That's like right. this is, this is the issue with them. He doesn't, they said that they were all in last off season, did basically nothing. <laughs> the splash play that Jerry Jones knows is fire the coach. Yes. And so that's Coming probably soon. what they're going to end up doing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Like we've just, we've seen this movie before. Mm -hmm. Usually it came with a team that was at least better in the regular season than this one. But I don't think there's really anything happening in the Cowboys right now that wasn't in a lot of ways predictable, if maybe enhanced by just how bad their record has turned out to be. Yeah, they don't need a splash play. They have a splash pad. They have the Death Star. They have the setup. They're okay there in Dallas. Will the MVP be won, Nora, by either Josh Allen or Lamar Jackson? Lamar can go for back to yes. back. You think it's one of answer? Yes, yeah. definitely. <laughs> one of those two guys. I can think. stop you right there. <laughs> okay. I think because it is sort of a narrative award. I think the spot that Josh Allen is in is a really good spot to be in. Right. Because one, he you know he's come close, but he hasn't won it before. And this Bills team, I think, was a little bit written off before this season. They're maybe surprising people. You know, Diggs is gone. They had the coordinator switch. He's got a defensive coach. There's like no one else to take the credit. And also, he plays like his hair's on fire. <laughs> Um, yeah, 90% of the time. So I, I really like the spot that Josh Allen is, is in, even if honestly, I think Lamar Jackson is probably playing the better football of the two. Um, but it's by a, a hair margin. And I, I just think the voters, um, the voters are going to be ready for, for an Allen and VP. Yeah, I do. I think that America's ready for an Allen, Allen MVP. Buffalo would love it, obviously. Plus 270. You can get Josh Allen right now. Uh, one last thing. And they're going to, I mean, right. they're running away with the division, of too. Course. Right? Like, there's going to be some real, seems like at the rate the Chiefs are going, the one seed in, in the AFC is going to be a tough get. But I do think there's this sort of like, aura of dominance that matters and you got the whole dig storyline right he left he didn't have a number one guy he's making keon coleman a rookie look like a number one receiver you know what i mean he's like you said the narrative all kind of builds up to josh allen winning mvp i think that is where we're headed at this point uh nora last thing football fans want to know what taylor swift is up to taylor swift wants to know what football fans are up to you know how this is this is a crossover uh of all crossovers right now nora so what do we need to know about 1989 and what do the football fans need to know i mean it's, it's like truly one of the iconic albums of a very iconic career. The Taylor pop turn. Right. Did this mean anything to you? Because this is sort of the album right. where she becomes like a true pop star, leaves country behind. She took over. She took over and she's sort of been taken over ever since. Nora, where can we find all your work? And then we'll let you go enjoy the rest of your day. The ringer.com. The ringer NFL show. Every single album. Wherever you get your podcasts. Wherever you get your preferably podcasts. Preferably on Spotify. Yeah, go get them on Spotify. Nora, you're the best. We appreciate you coming on the show. And we'll have you back in a couple of weeks. Thanks again. Thanks, Tate. That's all for this week's edition of Through the Ringer. Thanks to Cousin Sal, as always. Thanks to Nora for coming back on the show. We love talking to NFL with Nora. She's the best. We appreciate you tuning in, and we will see you next week here on Through the Ringer.